Hi, I'm Father Michael Barrett, pastor here at St. Agnes Church. And one of the things we want to talk about today is St. Agnes. St. Agnes was a virgin martyr. It's interesting, I started to think about the fact that she's a virgin and martyr. So to prepare this talk about her, she was 13 years of age when she died. Very young, but in those times, 13 was an adult. Many people got married by that age. And it occurred to me that this notion of her being a virgin, as well as a martyr, uh, made me think about virginity. Because I think one of the things today is people don't think being a virgin is all that important. It used to be, at least when I was young, uh, and for many years. But I think we've gotten away from that quite a bit. So, our Lord was a virgin, just to keep everything straight. And that's something that we keep in mind, that we're trying to imitate our Lord in a certain way. You could say that's one of the reasons why priests are celibate, is the same notion of being identifying with our Lord. Our Lady was a virgin. And Our Lady was a virgin before, during, and after giving birth to our Lord. It was a miraculous birth. She always was a virgin. And then St. Joseph, her husband. St. Joseph was, throughout his life, a virgin. He was never married before. Sometimes we see St. Joseph as an older man in paintings. But I think most people feel that St. Joseph was a younger man, probably in his 20 years of age. He was strong. He was a guardian of the Redeemer, which is the way St. John Paul II referred to him. And to be that kind of a man, he was, you could say, virile and alive and ready to do whatever had to be done. And part of his life also was to dedicate himself to God as a virgin. I think it's good for us to remember that because what's happening is these people and many of the virgins like St. Agnes are putting God at the center of their life. That's their first love. It doesn't mean that they've denied themselves of anything. It's that they have chosen a particular love. I think sometimes uh, we're in a society where we've lost the notion of true love. And that's where we've lost the notion of purity, doing things really in the true way. Today we think of a virgin as having, as being someone who has something wrong with them. You talk to high school girls, you talk to college girls, you talk to high school boys and college boys. Though mostly it's girls that talk about it, the whole question of virginity. When do you lose your virginity? Uh, and if you haven't lost it yet, why not? Why haven't you gone ahead and done that? I think that means that we have a whole different notion of what it is to be a virgin the way St. Agnes was a virgin. What do we mean by virgin? Well, basically it's that you don't have sexual intercourse, that that's what you have uh, put aside because of other loves that are greater to you. And um, we see that perhaps the most in the hookup culture that has come to be dominant in certain parts of our society, our universities, even our high schools. There's no commitment, there's no friendship, there's no bond, it's just hookup, period. So in that notion, the virgin is, doesn't fit at all, doesn't fit in a, a bit. When we really think about it, there is a great thing about pureness. There's a great thing about something being pure. We can think of, of gold and silver, for example. If you go to 47th Street in Manhattan, and you're looking at jewelry, you're looking at gold and silver, you want it to be pure. You don't want it to be mixed with other things. In fact, the word you could use is you, don't, you, you want it unadulterated, which is kind of interesting. The whole notion of adultery, of unadulterated gold and silver in the ring, in the bracelet, the necklace, whatever it is that you're trying to buy. So we love these things we realize that they have a certain value because of that. 
And we can say that a man or a woman who is pure in his dealings with his friends also has an attraction, something that uplifts us about that person. I think that a, a virgin, especially a woman who is a virgin, has a particular attraction to men around her because she is full of life and interesting because of that. Sometimes we pass that over, but I think it's something to keep in mind. I remember working years ago at a brokerage house in Wall Street, and I'd see young women coming out of the university who were virgins, began to work at the uh, company, and after a couple of years, you bump into them in the hallways and you realize that they're less vibrant. They look a bit put down and somewhat unhappy. And a lot of that was because they gave up their virginity among other things, but that was a big part. That was my own impression. Um, it Somehow it changed their personality, not for the best. Today, men who remain virgin become the topic of conversation for women who want to know why, how, why are they still virgins? Which one of us will be the first one will get that person, that boy, to give up his virginity? Who, who could do it? Sort of sad, but I'm talking about high school girls in Catholic high schools. I just throw that in as an aside, but it shows us somehow that we've lost the notion of what it is to be a virgin, that it's not just a game, it's an expression of love. It's a good thing, it's a very beautiful thing. Uh, sometimes I think we want to make friends with the people around us, and uh, including the person that we marry. You know, sometimes I, I think that a man and a woman don't always have that friendship. And sometimes we see that because when the marriage has difficulties, all kinds of difficulties, there's no friendship there to lean on. People say, well, we lived together for three years and we know each other very well, and we've been very intimate, so we, we're friends. No, it doesn't work that way. Sometimes I think it's counterproductive that we live together for three years and we think we're friends because we've been intimate, but we're not. Not really, not on the friendship level. So we have to push friendship. People feel close because they, they really love each other as the other person is, regardless of an aspect of sexuality. St. Agnes had it in her mind at the age of 13 to pledge herself to God. And she decided to remain close to him in her prayer and in her virtues. The way that she lived her life, the way she dealt with other people, which was exceptional, and that's what was attractive about her. And her strength to live virginity is a sign of the strength of love she has for God but also for those who are in her life. St. Agnes was full of love. Real love of her friends and the people around her. Something interesting to keep in mind. Um, her strength and virginity gave her this and it was a virtuous thing and outstanding. She wasn't wimpy, she wasn't a sad sack, she wasn't somebody who foolishly gave up her sexual relations. She was a powerful young woman who knew what she would do with her body and her sexuality. Most people do not have that kind of strength that she did, male or female, because the culture that we live in dictates to us something that is good that is not really good. And she had it. And that's why we're attracted to her. I think most people think virgins were women, not women and men, but it goes either way. And as I said, these people like Jesus and St. Joseph were virgins. And it was something about them that attracted others to them, that strength, that power. When people grow older, the sexual activities become less important, really. The, uh, what holds two people together when they get older is probably that friendship, something that goes deeper in their relationship. It helps them two times when they can't have sexual activity for whatever reason that may be. 
And I think also women have a different approach to sexuality. You know, going back to this sexuality, women have a different approach than men do. I think in many cases for men it's just actions and men's physical approach to things is different than a woman's physical approach. I think that for a woman, that whole sexuality goes back 24, 48 hours before the actual encounter people can have. For a guy, it's five minutes. But for a woman, it's something that takes time. And if you don't put that time in, it's not really good sexuality with the woman in the pair. We see that because people who have been living together and get married more often than not end up with a divorce because maybe they don't understand that notion of friendship. They don't understand the notion that sexual goes just beyond physical activities. That's a deep recognition of what the other person needs as a man or as a woman and especially a man looking at a woman. He understands who she is as a woman not just understands sexual activity. Um, according to tradition, Agnes was a member of the Roman nobility. She was already someone who was important, born in 291, so just at the end of the third centuries, third century. Um, she was Sorry, I got a little lost. So she was born in 1791, and then she died in 304. Now it's interesting that she um, came from a, a wealthy family, and people were very attracted to her. They were attracted to her because she was beautiful, noble family, and they wanted to suit her. Some of these men wanted to arrange some kind of a marriage. But they realized that she wasn't interested in that. Some of them began to realize that had to do with the fact that she was Christian. As a Christian, she had renounced marriage as a way of being close to God. So um, she suffered martyrdom in 304. And that martyrdom took place under Diocletian, who was the emperor at that time. You sometimes have heard of Diocletian and his persecutions. The, um, what what uh, occurred is that in um, those years, from really probably 303, Diocletian became the emperor and was very interested in persecuting Christians. And from 303 until 313, when Constantine became emperor, Diocletian was going after Christians big time, really trying to kill them as much as he could. Before that, there was other kinds of persecutions that were not as vicious or as strong as Diocletian. Uh, he, he, was, he was very, very determined. Um, the prefect Sempronius condemned Agnes to be dragged naked through the streets to a brothel. In one account, as she prayed, her hair grew and covered her body. It was also said that all of the men that attempted to rape her were immediately struck blind. The son of the prefect was struck dead because he approached her, but he revived after Agnes prayed for him to bring him back to life. Nevertheless, she was a Christian and Sempronius, the prefect, he still had to go after her, and he brought up the trial with another official judging rather than himself, since his own son had been rescued by St. Agnes. Kind of funny. So, uh, eventually she was found guilty of being a Christian. She was let out 
led out and bound to a stake where she was going to be burned. But the bundle of wood they put would not burn. They couldn't get it to start. Um, so then after that, they decided that they would cut off her head or behead her one way or the other. Some people said that someone took out his sword and just finished her off, whatever the case was. And it said that because of the cutting, the blood poured out on the ground and that all of the people collected the blood because they already knew that this woman was a martyr. And, you know, we have to remember that if you were a martyr, you were automatically a saint. There was no choice about it because you gave up your life for your faith. So Agnes then was buried on the Via Nomentana in Rome. So if you ever go to Rome, you can go and visit. There's two churches in Rome. One is outside of the walls of the city, the Via Nomentana. The other church is in Piazza Novona. And in Piazza Novona is where her head is preserved. I used to walk by that church all of the time when I lived in Rome. And the other church was outside of Rome and it had other parts of her body were buried there, other pieces of her body were um, kept there. After her death, a woman, and I'll see if I can spell this right, is Emerenciana, who was her foster sister, would go to the tomb where she was and pray. Um, she was um, praying to her because she knew that she was a martyr. And then because she was doing it, she was taken out and stoned to death. And she was eventually became a saint. So she was a half-sister of St. Agnes. Then also the daughter of Constantine at one point was leprous. And in order to cure the leprosy, she went to the tomb of St. Agnes. After praying there, she was cured. In fact, um, she and Emerenciana appear in the scenes from the life of Agnes, even down through the different centuries as this sainthood grew and people recognized that she was just an extraordinary woman. I think these are some of the ideas that we can see that St. Agnes from the very early church was super popular as a saint. And now we have two churches in Rome, and now we have St. Agnes here in New York City. We can also recognize that the St. Agnes Cathedral for Rockville Center is nearby, which is also to St. Agnes. Now there's a point here that I just don't quite remember, but it comes from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and with that we'll finish up. I thought I wrote it down. But it's the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And I'm trying to remember the number. I think it's 2332, somewhere, somewhere in there. And it's a very good piece because it points out what virginity is all about. And that... Um, it is understanding the relationship between a man and a woman. And in a way, it's understanding the emotions and the affections that each side has for the other. It, catechism is trying to say that the sexuality is something deeper than just sort of the sexual activities that we think about today in our rather superficial society and tries, us, tries to make us to realize that the sexuality takes up the whole person both persons involved. It doesn't just have a sort of a, a small meaning. It takes up the full person dealing with the other full person, which already has a sexual nature to it, without even talking about particular sexual activities. It's kind of a deep idea, but that's what the church maintains. And that's sort of behind what St. Agnes is all about. A great, extraordinary woman, even at 13, who had the courage to give up her life in martyrdom because she really loved God above all things. And I think any time of 
love when we see one person lay down his or her life for another, that's when we know that the love is really sincere, really true, the way Christ did, the way many people have done, to lay down your life for your brother, true love, whatever else happens, she had it. And that's why we have such great devotion to her. Her, her anniversary is January 21st, as I mentioned earlier. January 21 is the day that she died in uh, Rome, way back. So we ask you on this day, come to St. Agnes, or at least to pray to her for the strength of understanding virginity and being ready to be a martyr. God bless. Thank you very much.